John Keats was born on 31st October 1795 at the livery stable and alehouse known as the Swan and Hoop in Moorfields in the City of London. It belonged to his maternal grandfather, John Jennings, and in an age when horses and carriages were all important, it brought the family a good income. We know little about his father, Thomas Keats, except that he came from the West Country and worked as an ostler in the stables until he married Francis Jennings, the boss's daughter. He soon took over the management of the business. In the splendid church of St. George's, Hanover Square, a long way from home, 19-year-old Francis Jennings married Thomas Keats in 1794. Perhaps the choice of this church indicated their hopes of rising on the social ladder. It was certainly possible with their thriving business and the modest fortune amassed by her father. Christened in the local church of St. Botolph's Bishopsgate were their first son John and his two younger brothers George, born in 1797, and Tom in 1799. Little else remains of the city of Keats' time. Much of it was rebuilt in the 19th century or bombed and rebuilt again in the 20th. In 1795, the Swan and Hoop, however, was near to the edge of the city and in a good spot to service the business people who poured in and out. The Keats family did so well that they decided to live over the shop no longer and took a family house in Craven Street, about a mile north of the Swan and Hoop. On the way to work, Thomas Keats would pass the old Bunhill Cemetery, where dissenters like the poet William Blake or the author of Robinson Crusoe, Daniel Defoe, lay buried. On the other side of the road is the house of the great preacher John Wesley. When Thomas Keats took over the business, old Mr. Jennings and his wife retired to the village of Ponder's End, near Enfield, a few miles north of the city. At Enfield was a small school of 75 pupils run by a Mr. John Clark. Two of Mr. Jennings' own boys had been to the school, and the headmaster had a good reputation. It was natural that Thomas Keats and his wife should decide to send their boys there and when John was almost eight, he and his brother George went there as boarding pupils. Life could be said to be set fair for the three boys and their sister Fanny, born in 1803. A calamity befell them, however, which it took all their courage to overcome. On April 15, 1804, when John was eight years old, the Times records, Mr. Keats, livery stable keeper in Moorfield, went to dine at Southgate. He returned home at a late hour, and on passing down the city road, his horse fell with him when he had the misfortune to fracture his skull. He died the next morning, and his widow was left with her four children and little idea how to run a business. A chaos began for the Keats children, which was to rumble on throughout the life of the poet John and beyond. So the academy at Enfield and the stability it provided became even more important to them. Firstly, although the livery stables provided a good income, they were beyond Mrs. Keats' abilities to run. Within two months of her husband's death, she married a minor clerk, called William Rawlings, who claimed he could manage it for her. Almost as if she wanted to apologise for her haste in some way, amazingly they went all across town to be married at St. George's Hanover Square, where her first marriage had taken place. Back at Ponder's End, the grandmother, Mrs. Jennings, disapproved of this marriage and thought Rawlings was merely a fortune hunter. She assumed care of the four children. Then her husband, John Jennings, died. His contribution to the Keats family problem was that although he left a good fortune to his heirs, his will was utterly confused, so confused 
that the problems went rolling on and the last detail wasn't sorted out until more than 60 years later. Within six months, Keats' mother had left Rawlings and returned to her mother's house. The laws of the time meant that she had to give her money and the livery stable business to Rawlings. Women had no property rights. The husband, in the event of separation, kept everything. Happy to have her back, it was, however, a blow to the family fortunes. The boys remained at school, and the education they received there became more and more important to them. Mrs Jennings moved to a smaller house in Edmonton, a nearby town, and the youngest boy, Tom, joined his brothers at the school. Of great value to the young Keats was the friendship of Charles Cowden Clark, the son of the headmaster. Cowden Clark, here pictured later with his wife, was eight years older than John Keats and an assistant at the school. His friendship and guidance in study and in values was a great good fortune for the boy John. When Keats was fourteen, the boys returned from school to find their mother dying of tuberculosis of the lungs, or consumption, as it was commonly called. Consumption had killed her two brothers, and it was to carry off her three sons. It was a desperate and incurable disease. By mid-March 1810 the mother was dead. What would happen to the orphan children? The grandmother asked an old friend, Richard Abbey, to act as a trustee of the children's inheritance. Although confused, the inheritance should have been quite sufficient for their wants. Keats was allowed to stay for another year at Enfield, reading avidly, according to Cardin Clark, particularly translations of Greek mythology. In 1810, Keats left the academy at Enfield and, under Abbey's direction, fees were paid to a Dr. Hammond at Edmonton, where his grandmother's house now was just off the centre of town, pictured here. Keats was now an apprentice surgeon, and he began to learn how to set bones, pull teeth, and work as an apothecary. Given that he was nearly sixteen and that he needed to have a job with some future and some status, it was not a bad move. We know little of what Keats felt about his situation in Edmonton. In later years he would not talk about the calamities that beset his family. Cowden Clark tells us that he would often walk over to Enfield to talk poetry and books and enjoy Clark's company. Otherwise we have only a few poems written when he was around 18. At least we know that poetry was beginning to be part of his life. Guy's Hospital is situated in the borough of Southwark on the south side of the Thames, and along with St Thomas Hospital, which used to stand opposite, it has for centuries been a centre of medical studies. In October 1815, when he was almost 20, John Keats registered as a student, so that in the following year he could take the examinations which would allow him to be licensed to practice as an apothecary. Although most of the other buildings in Southwark have changed, many of Guy's older buildings remain, and the area is still the crammed, busy place it was in Keats' time. Medical students are still to be found, and in a building across the street has been preserved an old operating theatre, which gives something of the atmosphere of the scene that Keats must have known. This room dates from only a couple of years after Keats left. The lecture theatres were apparently crammed with students, and as the patients being sawn up or cut open did not have the benefits of anaesthetics, there must have been horrendous scenes here. These notes Keats made record the lectures of Dr. Astley Cooper, a famous surgeon and teacher of the day. While Keats wrote his lecture notes, he was writing more poems and made several friends amongst the students who shared his interest in literature and poetry. His friend Cowden Clark had sent his sonnet, O Solitude, If I Must Dwell With Thee, 
to Lee Hunt, who edited the famous literary journal The Examiner. Lee Hunt, whom Keats was soon to know well, liked it, and it was published on May 5, 1816. This was a great encouragement, and a consolation for the horrors of the dissection room he had to put up with. However much he disliked it and felt he was unsuited for the career of a surgeon, he passed the examination he finally sat in the Apothecary's Hall on July 25th, 1816. And he passed to a standard which surprised his friends. This meant that when he was 21, he could practice. Until then, however, he was free, free to go off and do what he wanted, namely, write poetry. He went to Margate. Margate is on the North Kent coast, on the estuary of the River Thames. Keats had never been there before, and apart from the fact that it was on the sea and a popular resort, he knew nothing about it. The visit to Margate was very important. He felt that in this new environment he might find subjects for his poetry. The sea suddenly delighted him, and no doubt he was surprised to find the little town so established and assertive. The poems he produced were, in fact, about poetry and how difficult it was to write. They took the form of verse epistles to his brother George and to his friend Cowden Clark at Enfield. The Margate trip, which lasted for a couple of months, was significant because it really marked his decision to devote himself to poetry. His return from Margate was marked by the sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. He visited his friend Cowden Clark, and together they read pieces from Chapman's famous translation. The result was his poem, the marvellous condensation of feeling and spirit, which was to characterise so much of his poetry. Keats was 21 in October, and in October he met Lee Hunt, the editor of The Examiner, who had published his sonnet. Hunt was a poet himself with a vivid style. As a friend and critic, he was very valuable to Keats, who became a constant visitor at his cottage in the Vale of Health, Hampstead. Hunt was warm-hearted, kindly, and generous in his admiration of Keats' poetry. Apart from being where he met Shelley and Reynolds, the other poets Hunt was encouraging, Hampstead, with its attractive houses and its proximity to the countryside, was a delight to Keats. He frequently stayed with Hunt and his wife and found it a place conducive to writing. In the same month, October 1816, he met at the Hunt cottage Benjamin Hayden, a painter, bull-necked and immensely energetic. They were hugely attracted to each other's personalities and became firm friends. Hayden painted huge historical canvases, which had their own merits but were difficult to sell. But his vibrant personality and exciting talent invited the friendship of most of the artists and writers of his day, including Wordsworth and Sir Walter Scott. Hayden was a valuable asset to Keats because he enthusiastically bolstered his confidence, but also because he lived and thought on a heroic scale. Without Hayden, Keats might easily have remained small-scale, like his friend Lee Hunt. This picture of Christ's entry into Jerusalem was painted while Keats was a frequent visitor to Hayden's studio, and Keats is represented in it by the face above Wordsworth. Hayden made a life mask of Keats to help him in the painting of the face. The mask was obligingly reproduced for his friends. John Reynolds was another new friend encountered at Lee Hunt's home that October. Reynolds, a year older than Keats, had already had three books of poetry published, so the two immediately struck up a rapport. Reynolds' parents had literary interests, and Keats was soon a welcome visitor at the family home, where he met Reynolds' very chatty sisters. The family and the sisters palled after a time, 
but the witty John Reynolds was to be his firm friend, and as it happens, very importantly, closest correspondent apart from his brothers. We know a lot about Keats, his personality, and his gifts from the letters he wrote to his brothers and his sister Fanny, and to his many friends. The letters alone are quite remarkable, setting aside the poems he was to write in his brief life. George Keats, a key recipient of these letters, was two years younger than John, and had, after leaving the Enfield School, worked in the counting house of Richard Abbey, their guardian. He was a warm and enthusiastic supporter of his brother's work. Tom Keats was four years younger than John, and always frail. He had a laughing and kindly manner which endeared him to everyone. He was to die of consumption aged only 18. John nursed him to the end, and it is likely that he caught the disease from Tom. At the time, it was not known to be infectious. Fanny, eight years younger than John, was sent by Abby to a boarding school near his country home in Walthamstow, and otherwise she lived with the Abbeys. John did all he could to keep closely in touch with her, and his letters to her are warm and entertaining. Pictured here in middle age, Fanny lived on until she was 86. With Hunt's help, and the urging of his friends, a publisher had agreed to publish his first book of poems. It came out on March 3rd, 1817. Of distinction, it contained only the sonnet on Chapman's Homer, and it did not sail. Today we are accustomed to the wonderful array of marbles from the Parthenon in the British Museum, as a part of the great heritage of classical Greece. In Keats' day, the marbles had been bought from the Turks by Lord Elgin, and Keats' friend Hayden was fiercely leading a campaign to have them bought by the nation. In the Greek sculptures of the 4th century BC, Keats saw genius reflecting on life. He was not far off the moment when he himself would in his poetry, display a genius of equally remarkable power. Luck was still with him. In April 1817, another publisher, John Taylor, seeing more than the public, offered to handle his work, advanced him £20, and took over the unsold copies of the first book. It was a great act of faith. The three boys had settled together in rooms in a house in Well Walk in Hampstead. They felt the country air would be good for Tom. Keats couldn't work there, however, and sought stimulation in the Isle of Wight. Shanklin, on the south side of the island, was altogether a more dramatic place than Margate. However, though he struggled to start his epic poem Endymion, he got nowhere, and within a week he was off to Margate again. It had worked before, perhaps it would work again. This time he found it desolate, and particularly bare of trees. He did some writing, he read carefully Shakespeare, and more Shakespeare, it seems. But after a week or two, he moved on to Canterbury, and then returned to Hampstead in early June. In Hampstead, all went well, and the massive task he had set himself, a 4,000-line poem in six months, was underway. By September, he was halfway, and he finished it by November 28th. Endymion is not the sort of poem that is easily read today, but for Keats, it was a sort of workout. He had to learn his craft, to handle words and imagery the way he wanted to. So, in fact, it was a triumph for him. By the time he was finished, he was never again lost for ideas. Endymion is a story in the mould of classical mythology. It involves pagan rites, nymphs and hymns to Pan. It is also full of the Keatsian qualities of imagery, allusion 
and a marvellous distillation of spirit and feeling. Considering his age and limited experience, the advance he made was phenomenal. Over the six months of Endymion, Keats had made more friends. Benjamin Bailey, who went on to make a career for himself in the church, wrote perceptively of Keats, I was delighted with the naturalness and simplicity of his character, and was at once drawn to him by his winning and indeed affectionate manner towards those with whom he was himself pleased. Among others caught by his personality and charm was the artist Joseph Seven. They first met in 1816, and in 1818 Seven did this miniature of Keats, one of the few portraits done in his lifetime. From all accounts, it is a rather soft and idealised portrait. The life mask taken by Hayden makes the features much sharper. With his friend Bailey, he went to Oxford and stayed a week or two in Magdalen Hall. He found the surroundings beautiful and the atmosphere and companionship in Bailey's rooms conducive to work and thought. Bailey was intelligent and well-read, and took Keats seriously. They went to Stratford, and at Shakespeare's birthplace, and the church where he was buried, Keats was happy to follow the thousands who had gone before him. Shakespeare remained for him a unique and abiding strength and inspiration. In the early months of 1818, he was revising in Dimir, but by March 4th, he set off to join his brothers at Tainmouth in Devon, where George had taken Tom for the winter to convalesce. However, Tom's health was deteriorating. George wanted to emigrate to America, yet couldn't easily leave Tom unless John took over care of him. It was a terrible dilemma, which, so close and caring were they of each other, they couldn't easily face. Both Tom and John wanted to support George's plans for a new life. How could they not? So, at Tainmouth they wrestled with this problem and John pondered the new direction his poetry had to take. Milton and Shakespeare could be admirable models, but he had to write in his own age, an age with its own special values and outlook. Tom assured everyone he was better. On the strength of that, George married and set off for America. John began a walking tour to Scotland with another good friend, Charles Brown. Brown was strong and vigorous, with a so far unsuccessful background of trade in St. Petersburg, where he'd gone bankrupt. He was more like George or Bailey than Keats, but he loved literature and admired Keats and was a staunch friend. They walked 600 miles up to Inverness. By then, Keats was ill. He returned by boat from nearby Cromarty to find that Tom was seriously ill and requiring constant nursing. He had to forget about his own health and write as best he could in between. He also had to cope with the critics, who by now had digested his endymion. Three journals had attacked it. The critic of Blackwood's magazine, John Lockhart, about a year older than Keats, took the common right-wing Tory view that a Keats with a meagre education was out of his depth and should have stuck at being an apothecary. Lockhart went on to Mellow and marry the daughter of Sir Walter Scott. During the time of Tom's final illness, he died on December 1st, 1818. Keats produced a fragment of an epic called Hyperion, which was to be the work most admired by his contemporaries. It was the beginning of Keats' incredible final burst of writing. As if aware he did not have long to live, he covered a wider range than just his poetry. He even wrote a play, Otto the Great, and achieved in his work greater quality than most artists do in a long lifetime. Most of that work was done here. The house, just built and known then as Wentworth Place, was bought by Brown 
and a friend, Dilke. It looks like one house, but it was built as two. Brown insisted that on the death of Tom, Keats should move in with him. Keats had two rooms at the rear, and it proved a wonderful boon to him. Here he wrote most of the poetry by which he is today remembered. Here, too, came to stay, in the Dilke half of the house, Fanny Braun. Eighteen, when Keats met her, he found her beautiful, elegant, silly, fashionable, and strange. His letters to her, begun about six months later, have become a major part of his literary fame. Here, pictured in later years, Fanny Braun, he felt, loved him for himself, and not just for his poetic gifts, though there is little doubt she had the intelligence to appreciate his work. To have experienced such a love as he did in his short life was a great boon, and certainly it had an inspiring effect on his poetry. Fanny's detractors in later years claimed she wasn't good enough for him. However it was, her existence next door at Wentworth Place lightened his life. By the end of 1819, they were engaged. But by this time, he was already suffering from the consumption that was to end his life. He wrote the first of his letters to her on July 1st, 1819, when he was staying on the Isle of Wight. He accused her playfully of entrammeling him, of destroying his freedom. It was to be this way to the end. If his poetical ambition was frustrated by the illness which overcame him, then equally he felt cheated of the happiness he longed for with Fanny. Overcome by illness and the financial difficulties which continued to plague him, by the end of summer 1820 the situation was so bad that his doctors said only a winter in Italy could save him. Accompanied by Joseph Severin, the artist, Keats set sail on September 17th, beset by money problems, which Abbey, as usual, claimed he could not alleviate. Severn could not have guessed what he was in for. Their boat took six weeks to get to Naples. Keats had just turned 25. In Rome, they quickly found rooms in this corner building of what are known as the Spanish Steps, in an area popular with the English. Keats had medical knowledge and experience of consumption enough to know that his fate was sealed. He lay on his bed in Rome, listening to the fountain play in the piazza outside and waiting for the end. He wrote to his friends, but he could write no more to Fanny directly, writing only to her mother. Seven sketched him as he lay and nursed him to the end on February the 23rd, 1821. Only his devoted friends and a few perceptive readers were as yet aware of the legacy he had left to the world. <laughs>